Lord Robert watched the sunset over the barrier mountains that protected Josephine to the north and west. The sky as red as all the blood he knew would soon be spilled. Standing atop a small wooden guardhouse directly above the main gate to the Parapan capital city, Robert was ready to lead his valiant but decimated army against yet another onslaught of Benzars. Standing beside the inner circle's own representative to Parapa, the Honorable Vel himself. An angry wind, a harbinger of doom, rushed past Robert's graying hair as the Lord glanced upon the city entrance below, the area as silent and foreboding as any grave. Except for the dozens of huddled and exhausted soldiers standing ready to defend the tortured city below, not a soul could be seen, the town's inhabitants either hiding in their homes or fled altogether. The middle-aged leader drew a heavy sigh and turned back toward the setting sun, watching it slip away like all the hopes and dreams he once possessed for the proud people of Josephine. Salutations. I am Lord Robert, responsible for all of Parappa and its capital city, Josephine. There was a time when I held great pride in my duties, but that had long since passed. Dusk has come, Bell calmly observed scanning the eastern horizon for signs of the approaching Benzars. Robert slowly nodded and turned to gaze in the same direction. Vel, began the Lord after several moments of silence, do you realize tonight marks the first year of the Benzar invasions, the new ones, that is? It has been a terrible year for Josephine, a terrible year for all of Mariga, the elderly but powerful wizard replied. I often wonder if the Sislan utopia is indeed coming to an end. I thought you weren't allowed to speak of such things, Robert gasped, surprised by the comment. Who are we kidding? The Benzars attacking Josephine again? The Ultimates in Shigoria challenging the inner circle? The massing Guraks to the far north? I'm afraid the age of reason may have long since passed. Robert simply stared at Vel, shocked and discouraged by the opinion. The, po the political leader of Josephine had come to know Vel as a wise and adept member of the circle, a devout wizard who had given his entire life to the cause of American justice, an icon of hope and optimism and honor. Wearing little except the simple white robes that marked him as a circle representative, Vel's tight skin and thinning gray hair seemed pale in the approaching twilight, the many shadows lining his face not unlike the secret fears embedded in his tired heart. Such pessimism was not like Vel. Robert drew silent and lowered his gaze, and although it was far too distant to see, looked in the direction of the Evil Root Forest two days' march away which spewed forth its legions of murderous animates. How many would come this time, Robert wondered with dread. Fifty? One hundred? Two hundred? The weary leader carefully scanned the grasslands and mixed prairie beyond the city, knowing in the back of his mind that the remaining army couldn't possibly repel any more than a handful of the soulless monsters this time. Robert lowered his gaze and looked upon the wide wall of vegetation encircling the city to his left and right, terminating at the massive wooden doors of the main gate immediately below. Although quite wide and protective, the massive plant colony that had, placed, that had been placed around the city had nevertheless been perforated several times recently by the Benzars, and not enough guards remained to completely protect and defend the vegetative wall. All Robert could do now was hope that the magical enchantment placed upon the living wall by the healer priests of the Sicilian church two days earlier would help to repel the approaching Benzar armies. 
The Benzars, here they come! A nearby soldier suddenly shouted, pointing out into the approaching darkness. In no time, Robert and Vel had spotted several dozen bands of monsters slowly approaching from the southeast, each group consisting of twenty or so of the mindless foes. Once ordinary human beings, the Benzars had had their very souls stripped from them and replaced with powerful but corrupt Machika, transforming them into living robots without conscience or compassion. Worse, a tiny dot of red light emanated from each of them, a magical energy contained within the small bone daggers they wielded, capable of transforming those struck into Benzars themselves. The monsters had never before attacked so soon after sunset, and anticipation quickly turned to terror as Robert counted over 200 Benzars, the largest assemblage ever to attack the desperate city. The guards below began shouting various commands to each other in preparation for the attack, well-rehearsed procedures to repel the invading monsters, while bellowing noises from specially carved animal horns wailed their warning of the impending attack throughout the city. Shall I inform the Supreme Healer Priest, sir? queried a loyal guard from behind, almost surprising the Lord. Stunned by the tremendous army beyond, many moments passed before Redfern, or before Robert found the words to even respond. There's hundreds of them. Tell Gep Tell Gepinor only the shark can save us this time. Go! The soldier nodded and leaped for the ladder leading down and away his army of carefully assembled slats of petrified wood making little noise as he descended. Dressed in stone battle armor himself and covered by thick furs, the heavy weight of the metamorphic rock nullified by powerful Machika, Robert slowly drew his massive doom sword and turned to Vel, the brave and heroic adventurer never more afraid in his entire life. Member Vel, raise the defenses! Vel nodded and scanned the approaching army one last time, his own immense concern plainly etched across his beaten face. The powerful wizard closed his eyes and drew a deep breath, so deep that it hurt, and began to concentrate upon the vegetation encircling the city, visualizing the massive organism in his mind as he channeled the living Majika around him and through the very core of his being. Once again, opening the channel, the energy of all living things quickly poured through his soul, gathering focus and direction, wild but under the control of a strong heart and convictions of sincere desire. The vigil, our last great defense. It's up to me to make it come alive. Must summon as much magic as I can. The Benzars must not be allowed into the city. Reaching out with his mind, Bell probed the living wall of vegetation, grasping the plant with mental force, becoming one with the massive organism. Although the living wall possessed no will of its own, Bell provided temporary consciousness to it, slowly releasing his accumulated magical energy into and through the plant and causing the vegetation to absorb a primitive sentience. Within moments, the individual ramets of the great organism began to slowly move and twist, alive with Vel's powerful spell, and prepared themselves for the oncoming Benzars, the plant appendages now aware of their surroundings and protective purpose. Vel transferred the last of his living energy his living magic to the maze of vegetation and opened his eyes just in time to watch the first wave of Benzars reach for the barred main gate. Immediately, dozens of thick, thorny branches and tendrils reached out for the animate monsters, silently grabbing hold of them and penetrating, preventing their penetration of the city. Unaware of the living force that was now stopping them from their programmed mission, terrible monsters hacked at the fronds of the plant, 
but Vel's magic finished off several of the Solus animates, the vegetation crushing them with incredible force. Unfeeling and unafraid, however, additional Benzars attacked the animated vegetation, the massive plant simply unable to counter the sheer numbers of the Benzar force. A sudden whining noise, quickly gaining in pitch, stole Robert's attention, and he looked up to see an approaching ball of fire. Quite unable to do anything about it, the meteor-like projectile slammed into the living wall just 20 feet from Robert and exploded, tearing into the animated plant and ripping a small section to shreds. A second fireball quickly forced Robert and Vel to duck for cover as it crashed into the main gate itself, severely damaging the mighty construction and knocking the pair of men violently to the floor. As several more fireballs approached, Robert regained his feet and instinctively yelled to his soldiers below to ready themselves for the terrible horde that would soon be upon them. Robert then looked into the distance and spotted the familiar ghostly light everyone had come to call the Angel of Death. The image appeared as a glowing woman with long blazing robes of white light that lifted around her as if she were enveloped within a mighty whirlwind. Robert cursed at the sight of the woman, but could do little as he watched yet another meteor spring from the ghostly image and again smash into the main gate, this time blowing the construction off its mighty hinges and showering the nearby guards with splinters and debris. With both the vegetative wall and main gate breached, the remaining Benzars poured through the rubble-filled entrances and spilled into the city, initiating utter chaos as they attacked the guards with their glowing daggers of death. Robert leaped down from the guardhouse with his mighty doom sword and began hacking and slashing like the genuine hero he was fighting as if the entire universe was at stake. Seeing this, the Josephine soldiers rallied around their brave lord, the least lucky of the defenders laying down their lives in defense of the city they loved. Unable to participate in physical combat, Val headed away from the scene, watching in disgust as those struck by the magical daggers were quickly transformed into Benzars themselves causing them to stumble back out of the city to one day attack those they had just been defending. The sight of these soulless soldiers rising from the sight of their spiritual demise utterly enraged Vel, and he swore revenge as he left for a safer location deep within the heart of Josephine. The weapons of the Benzars contain corrupt Majika. It was transforming our valiant soldiers into Benzars themselves, the very monsters they were fighting. Never before have I felt such rage. For the next hour, the soldiers fought valiantly, holding their position and keeping the Benzar reinforcements from driving through. Robert's intense bitterness fueled his need to destroy the Benzars and helped him single-handedly defeat several dozen of the mindless but powerful monsters. As the sky turned as black as the eyes of the Benzars, Robert finally pulled himself out of the melee to catch his breath and survey the desperate situation. To his surprise, only a few dozen monsters remained, and Robert's heart skipped a beat with the realization that the Benzars might actually be repelled once again. Cracking the grin of a victor, Robert waded back into the battle to defeat the remaining monsters. Ugh! Another one destroyed! And look, we've killed most of them. Sisla, be my witness. We have the upper hand. Yes, yes, we will drive them off yet again. Several distant blasts caused Robert to turn, however, and the exhausted hero immediately recognized that the attack at the gate had simply been a diversion. 
the whole of the Benzar army was penetrating the city's defenses from the north. Robert's momentary glee washed away in anger and terror as he ordered his soldiers to continue the immediate fight, turning to rush for what he knew had to be the Benzar's true target, the Sislin Church. Leaving the chaos behind, Robert leaped for the cobbled path leading away from the main gate and bolted away into the city, desperate to reach the church before the newest Benzar threat. She had tricked us. It was all a diversion. And I knew instantly where the main Benzar forces were headed. Our beloved Sislin church. The grand capital of Josephine had been constructed centuries ago in a nearly perfect circle and carved entirely out of the surrounding metamorphic rock its various buildings now rising from the floor of the city as shadowy spires in the virtual darkness. Finally spotting the magenta light that spilled from the central area of the city ahead, the frantic lord slowed his pace a bit, concerned that each dark corner potentially concealed a small army of the soulless animus. Yet Robert reached the central area of the capital city without a single encounter and his eyes soon adjusted to the neon-like radiance that dominated the governmental section of the city. This was the general location from which all the affairs of the state were conducted. Dozens of offices and warehouses and meeting places were sculpted from the underlying rock and skillfully arranged along the perimeter of a wide, grassy knoll that marked the heart of the capital. Continuing along the gravel path and passing between the colorful walls toward the large field beyond, the way was illuminated by hundreds of thin, magical lights that ran along the outer vertices of the buildings, their cold brilliance casting a rich and wondrous glow over the inner city. The spectacular sight reminded Robert of the dire consequences of failure, rejuvenating his spirit and renewing his hatred of the Benzars. Indeed, as Robert stepped toward the open square beyond, several Benzars appeared out of nowhere to destroy the Lord. But Robert made short work of them, hacking the monsters to pieces in violent anger before turning back toward the impressive grassland before him. Entering the vast square, Lord Robert quickly fixed his gaze upon the two most important structures within the capital, the Parapan Tower to his right and the glorious Sislin Church to his left, both iconic remnants of a time when Marigo was genuinely peaceful and the Sislin Utopia was at its zenith. The red marble tower was slender and quite tall, nearly 50 feet in height, while several white banners hung from the apex of the tower to a length of nearly 20 feet, splashed with the colors of the rainbow. The seat of power within all of Pirapa, Robert paid little attention to his actual home and instead carefully scanned the adjacent white marble church, its material once reworked with living Majika to physically transform the surrounding stone and emanate a profound whiteness. The beautiful construction glowed with a soft inner light, a countenance of supreme peace and tranquility, and the front consisted mostly of a stone stairway that rose nearly 20 feet before terminating at the base of a wide platform that led to several massive doors 10 feet beyond. Standing atop the platform defending the glorious structure was a line of healer priests, each dressed in the colorful robes of their faith. Robert breathed a heavy sigh of relief that the church had not yet been attacked. After glancing about for signs of the marauding Benzars again, Robert stepped forward in the direction of the church, about to join the healer priests in the defense of the holy institution. Racing through the large open field, Robert soon reached a dominating wooden stake to which enemies of the city had once been fastened to and executed, a 
practice he had put a stop to after coming to power two years ago. Robert looked at the appalling structure and recalled the execution of Sandrus, the former lord of the city who was responsible for the original Benzar invasions against Josephine and was subsequently burned at the stake for her crimes. Indeed, the death of Sandrus had freed Josephine from her blasphemous agenda and allowed the Sislin church to appoint Robert as Parappa's new leader, even without consent of the inner circle. Though Robert still wasn't sure of all the facts, he understood that Sandrus had been an enemy of the Sislin utopia, even though she was a circle representative, and he felt little pity for his predecessor as he passed by the horrible sight. Several shouts of alarm suddenly ripped through the air, and Robert watched in horror as a second army of Benzars spilled into the square between his marble tower and the pristine whiteness of the Sislin church beyond. Taking cover near the wooden post of the execution area, Robert cursed as the monsters made their way to the base of the church, as if directed there by a single governing consciousness. Realizing he was now separated from the priests and unable to help, Robert clenched his fists in anger, wondering how so few could defend the church against so many. Damn, I'm too late! There they are! They mustn't get the shard! They mustn't! But the priest can't stop them, and neither can I! As the Benzar horde surged forward, the healer priests continued to hold their ground, taking each other's hands in prayer as the animate crowd below swelled into the hundreds. The five priests then reached for small stony talismans hanging about their necks, doing so with the calculated precision of a crack military unit. The talismans were pure lifestone, Robert knew, naturally full of concentrated mochika and as potent as any slice of nemophore. Yet the power could only be invoked by those possessing intense faith and conviction, for only the strongest of hearts could mentally will the living energy from the life stone and transform their own inner will into genuine reality. While true wizards of the world were able to do this through the ritual of rebirth alone, making them the most powerful wielders of the Chica throughout Merida, Others could rely upon naturally occurring sources of Majika to alter reality, and the goodly, if not idealistic, priests of the Sislin Church were quite adept at the summoning of such energy through their unquestioned faith in Sisla and her divine code of the land. The process of tapping the living Majika contained within the life stones took time, however, and Robert watched with fearful anticipation as the hideous monsters reached the top of the stairway, about to destroy the healer priests with their spikes of death. But the priestly heroes were able to summon the power of their faith at the last moment, drawing magical energy from their enchanted icons and concentrating the potent stuff into one focal point directly before them, a supreme light that forced the advancing Benzars to turn away. The sphere of power then exploded, blasting the horde of Benzars with holy light and ripping through the closer monsters like a tidal wave of fire. Dozens of the animates immediately combusted, blowing apart with terrific force, while the remaining creatures lost their balance from the sudden maelstrom and toppled over one another, trying to keep the radiant light out of their soulless eyes. Even Robert was forced to turn away from the intensity, although the light felt warm and comforting upon his spirit-bound flesh.
Moments later, the spell ended, and Robert slowly turned back to watch the exhausted healer priests let go of their talismans, quite fatigued by the magical summoning. Below them lay several dozen burning Benzars, but the remainder of the animate army slowly climbed back to their feet and began to stagger forward again, unstopped by the priest's attack. Indeed, Robert could only curse again with the realization that the clergymen had only temporarily succeeded in the defense of their sacred temple, and that only moments remained before the Benzars would recover from the blast to assault the church once again. His eyes adjusting to the darkness again, the Lord then heard the murmur of voices from behind and turned to realize he was no longer alone. Dozens of ordinary Josephine citizens had come to witness the violation of their church, their anger apparently outweighing their fear of the Benzars. Seeing a glimmer of hope for the church beyond, Robert seized upon the opportunity and stood to face the crowd, his voice strong and encouraging. Citizens of Josephine, can we allow the Benzars to just take our beloved shard of life, handed down to us by Sisla herself? began the Lord, his eyes begging for help. I can defend the church myself, but I need your help to reach it. Follow me, and together we can still fight to protect what is ours. With a thunderous roar, the crowd surged forward and quickly engaged the surprised army, fighting with whatever household tools and instruments they happened to be carrying. While the healer priests had managed to destroy or incapacitate only a few dozen of the monsters, the majority of the hideous humanoids that remained were still temporarily blinded by the holy attack and thus unable to defend themselves, allowing the citizens to meet with initial success. Robert then hacked his way through the horde of monsters and raced up the marble steps of the Sislin church. Reaching the line of delighted healer priests moments later, Benzar blood running down his massive doom sword and collecting near his muddied feet. Glancing back to view his fellow townsmen bravely defending the church, Robert ordered the tired priests to protect the entrance to the grand construction at all costs before stepping through one of its richly carved double doors, intent upon finding the supreme healer priest somewhere inside. After passing through an, an initial antechamber, Robert finally reached the heart of the church, its walls a splendid mixture of variegated marble that cleverly represented several series of triumphant rainbows, the beautiful metaphor representing the many ideals of the Sicilian utopia. Indeed, even the skillfully crafted oak pews were aligned around the central altar in a semi-arch tall red marble pulpit rising more than 10 feet above the crystalline altar directly below. The amazing color and beauty of the church was inspirational, even at such a desperate time, instilling in Robert an even stronger motivation to serve and protect the mighty institution. Checking for signs of life but spotting no one, Robert cautiously passed through the grand construction and soon reached the altar covered with cloth of various colors. Hearing a noise and whirling around, the Lord watched as Gepin Nor stepped into the temple from the opposite end, moving with the deliberate slowness of one possessing a great deal of weight. Though dressed in the colors and fine fabric of the church, the clothes were becoming tight around Nor's bulging frame and the lifestone talisman that hung from his neck seemed to nearly strangle the overweight cleric. Although mocking and even rude at times, Gepinor was still the supreme healer priest of Parappa, and Robert had come to know him as an extremely dedicated holy man, an absolute defender of the code. Though possessing such convictions as to even defy the inner circle at times, in fact, it had been Gepin Nor who selected Robert as the new Lord of Josephine after the execution of Sandrus, without the approval or guidance of the circle. But 
Robert felt completely confident of the priest's abilities, someone he could trust and defend with his very life. I am Gebin Noor, Supreme Healer Priest of the Sislin Church and Grand Protector of all Parapan souls. The Great Spirit Sisla guides and protects me and has blessed me with the power to forever honor and serve the Sislin Church, its supremeness unmatched in all Mariga, including the Inner Circle. Nearly out of breath from his descent into the glorious chamber, Gepinor hacked and wheezed several times before finding enough air to communicate. Sisla blesses us. You arrive safely, began the priest, obviously quite pleased to be standing near a trusted friend. I thought I would have to defend the shard on my own. You almost did. Where is it? The supreme healer priest was already holding the religious artifact and showed the priceless gem to Robert, the holy object appearing as a thick icicle nearly two feet long and softly glowing with an inner yellow light. Robert had seen the shard many times before, but was always impressed with the artifact and again smiled, the object radiating enough magica to warm his exposed skin and cause him to slightly tingle. The wondrous shard of life component to the life star that Sisley used to defeat the corrupts and end the age of damnation. I shall defend it with my life. How many are there this time? Depenor asked, his nervousness beginning to show. It seems the angel of death has brought many hundreds to our beloved place. They destroyed the main gate, broke into the city just north of here, and only Sisla knows where else, Robert replied, looking out a nearby window. Our faithful citizens have engaged the army just outside, but I don't think they'll hold them for long. And where is the old fool Vel? How has he helped? Having long since recognized the animosity between Vel and Gepinor, something he would never understand, Robert again was forced to choose his words carefully. Val has served us well, Supreme. I'm sure he is providing his assistance somewhere within the city. He's probably hiding in terror somewhere, Nor responded, his disgust for the man quite apparent. It's up to us now, I fear. As Robert was about to respond, Gepinor put his hand out, wishing for sudden quiet. Listening carefully, the two leaders could hear cries of terror from the defeated townspeople outside, and they recognized that the dreaded monsters would soon come rushing through the church doors beyond. Indeed, the band of healer priests standing just outside the front doors were already abandoning their defense, retreating back into the entry chamber of the temple make a last valiant stand against the animate horde. Supreme One, only the power locked within the shard can save us now, began Robert, carefully controlling his mounting fear. You must use the shard. I believe you're right. I only hope I can. Robert cocked his head, surprised by the comment. Gepinor had said that if the attacks continued, he would one day need to invoke the power of the Shard himself, even at the risk of his own life. Although no one had tried to invoke its magic in decades, not since the fall of Evil Deep nearly a century ago, nor had assured everyone that he and he alone possessed the tremendous heart and faith required to invoke the Magicka stored within the Shard. Now that everything else had failed to stop the Benzars, the Shard represented a last desperate hope for the weary city, a final chance Gepinor was apparently admitting might not even occur. Frustrated by the revelation, Robert turned to address the issue, only to be halted by a sudden attack at the church doors beyond. 
as the line of healer priests positioned themselves within the entry chamber of the Sislin Temple, Robert glanced back to Gepinor, the cleric's hand securely around the shard as he prepared to draw forth its tremendous power. His own doom sword ready for further action, Robert turned back toward the large doors as the unstoppable force outside quickly smashed through and invaded the antechamber of the church. Once again, the colorful priests invoked the power of their talismans, controlling the summoned Majika with their own practice spirituality. Tired from the expenditure of holy energy minutes ago outside the temple, however, this time the blast of radiant light barely slowed the dreaded monsters, and they soon pushed past the terrified clerics, slaughtering the slower men and chasing the rest away. Robert immediately stepped forward to protect Gepinor as the Benzar surged forward, the shard quite obviously their intended goal. Please, Supreme One, Robert demanded, their time now very short. It's now or never. Deep in concentration and nearly oblivious of the approaching monsters, Gepinor continued to summon the power within the shard, relying upon his own sense of inner faith and social conviction to tap the tremendous Majika locked within. To aid him, Gepinor recalled the legends of Sisla, the human woman who became the first true wizard of Meriga and ultimately defeated the Guraks to end the millennium-long Age of Damnation. For her liberation of the human race and development of the Sislan Utopia, Sisla became a goddess after her mortal death, to be forever loved and worshipped, and Gepinor drew additional strength from the many accomplishments made by the Sislan Church through the centuries as well. The power of the shard. I'm almost there, almost invoked. I shall save the people of Josephine, and without the help of the cursed circle. Nearly seizing the internal power of the shard, the potent artifact blinked with raw, limitless energy several times, splinters of Majika spewing forth in random directions. But Gepinor knew there was a dark side to him as well, a fury against the inner circle and its strict domin dominion over the people of Meriga, a conviction that the circle itself should be destroyed in order for the church to wield absolute power throughout the world. Within a small but substantial portion of the priest's heart lay bitterness and contempt, even the seeds of evil, a haunting Nor had been hoping would not prevent his invocation of the shard. But the power did not come, would not flow from artifact to intellect. And Gepinor slowly realized that all was indeed lost, and that he would now have to pay the ultimate penalty for his past hypocritical transgressions. Defiant to the Come through me, all powerful shard. Help me to help this land. No, it's not working. Please, please, spirits of the shard, pour through me. I am great enough for your power. Defiant to the end, Robert lifted his heavy weapon to destroy as many of the Benzar as he could, the horde pouring through the temple entrance like water over a dam. A sharp crackling then filled the church, a splintering of the air so powerful that it nearly deafened the Valiant Lord, and the hero watched in disbelief as a solid wall of ice materialized between himself and the advancing monsters forming an impenetrable barrier just in time to prevent the Lord's demise. Turning with sudden glee in anticipation of Gepinor's successful tapping of the shard, Robert instead found the inner circle representative Vel standing in the doorway, the terrible pain of casting such a potent spell still etched across his wrinkled brow. The wizard let go of his captured breath and forced open his stinging eyes, 
then glanced in the direction of the wall of ice that spanned the width of the entire chamber, nearly a foot thick in some places. Well done, Member Vell, Robert cried, his life momentarily spared. I'd almost given up. Stepping into the besieged temple, Vell turned away from the wall of ice as he reached Robert and Gepinor, the priest offering little more than a sneer in thanks for the miraculous protection. Quite accustomed to this behavior, Vell ignored Gepinor and addressed Robert with concerned calm. We're completely surrounded, Lord Robert. The angel of death has directed her forces well. The supreme healer priest is about to invoke the shard if, if we can give him enough time. Robert responded, not realizing that Nora's attempt had already failed. But I need more silence, please, Gepinor roared, about to repeat the ritual. Hearing a strange noise from beyond, Bell turned to notice the Benzars already chipping their way through the wall of ice twenty feet away, a barrier he had hoped to be impenetrable. Robert noticed the concerned effort of the monsters as well, and was quite surprised by the organizational skills of the unthinking creatures. At this rate, they'll be through in no time. I couldn't believe it. They were chipping through the ice. Understand, Benzars can't think for themselves. So the angel of death must have somehow been controlling them, even within the church. I believe our fate lies in the hands of the healer priest, then, Bell answered, equally surprised. I have very little power left to stop them again, I'm afraid. His entire consciousness directed toward the shard of life again, the supreme healer priest continued his intense concentration, reaching deep into his inner soul to ignite the potentially limitless Majika locked within the artifact and release the living power within. But the cancer of corruption that lay buried within Nora's subconscious, his hatred for the inner circle, and thirst for ultimate power through the church, effectively prevented the shard from surrendering its awesome and untainted power. Watching the pathetic attempt fail, all Vel could do was shake his head, disappointed but not at all surprised. I'm afraid the healer priest hasn't the faith to utilize the power of the shard. Bell finally whispered, breaking the silence. How dare you, cried Gepinor, opening his eyes a second time in embarrassment and utter frustration. My faith in the Sislin church is second to none. Perhaps, Bell calmly replied. The Benzar is about to break through the icy wall of beyond, but the shard requires the faith of the pure, the honor of the righteous, the heart of the altruistic. As I've always said, healer priest, you lack these qualities and have become the very thing the Sislin Church was formed to defeat. Sheer hatred exploded from Gepinor, and in his sudden fury, Nor screamed several terrible words, words not to be spoken by anyone, especially a healer priest. But the defeat and subsequent humiliation suffered by Gepinor before Robert and Val was now complete, and for a moment all Nor wanted to do was reach out and strangle the patronizing inner circle member, needing to blame someone for his own dismal failure. The crash of breaking ice quickly brought Nor back to reality, however, and the three Josephine officials turned to watch as the Benzars finally smashed through the magical wall to continue their undying pursuit of the Shard. Get to the second floor, I'll hold them here, Robert cried to Val and Gepinor, realizing his plan invoked, involved the sacrifice of his own life. The Lord of the City sprang forward once again, placing himself between his two allies and the approaching monsters. Still angry, but the terror growing within, Gepinor waddled toward the temple exit across the chamber reaching the far end just as Robert engaged the first of the Benzars. 
Other sections of the icy wall then broke down under the surge of the monsters, releasing the entire horde upon the hopelessly outnumbered Lord and finalizing his doom. Unwilling to allow Robert to sacrifice himself, however, Vel bravely stood his own ground and began to summon as much Majika as he could, his body nearly wrecked from the recent summoning of living power through his reborn mind. As the tidal wave of Benzar surged forward to inundate Robert, Vel focused what little Majika he was able to summon upon a final transformation, throwing himself forward and upon Lord Robert. Flesh instantly became stone, and within an instant Vel had polymorphed them both into a single statue, an impenetrable material the Benzars could not hope to damage. The transformation naturally caused Robert and Vel to pass into unconsciousness, but the two were rendered quite safe, Vel's life-sustaining Majika keeping the glowing daggers of the monsters from destroying the two valiant heroes. Turning back to witness Vel's altruistic act, Gepinor swallowed hard as the Benzar army quickly focused their black, glassy eyes on him, filling the priest with horror and disgust. Having come to know the Benzar as well, Nor had hoped he would never be called upon to summon the powerful shard to destroy the animate army, not so much for the price he would need to pay to utilize its Majika, but for fear of his inability to control the shard in the first place. Yet his worst fears had just come to pass, a terrible spiritual defeat he knew he could neither accept nor admit. As if the Benzars had become physical manifestations of Nor's inner failures, the monsters approached to destroy the priest, hastening his retreat from the temple chamber. The healer priest was stunned, however, as he found another small army of monsters beginning to spill through the doorway entered by Vel just moments later. Trapped within the temple, Nor stumbled back to the stone pulpit, climbing its brief stairway as the Benzars fully encircled him from below. Reaching the platform where priests normally go to deliver their messages of courage and faith, all Gepinor could feel was fear and hopelessness, and he began to weep with frustration and humility, begging for Sisla to somehow materialize and help the pathetic priest. Nor cried out several times for the horrid monsters to leave, but the Benzars methodically continued their pursuit of Nor climbing the stairway as well and reaching to within a few feet of the defenseless man. Unprepared for death, Gepinor's pitiful cries became loud enough to wake the dead, the priest having lost all control of himself and now acting purely out of primitive instinct. Gone now was the honor of defense to the end, of faith in absolute ideals, of courage in the face of mortal danger. As if casting his innermost convictions aside, Gepinor flung the shard down into the crowd of Benzars below, hoping in his temporary madness that the monsters would take the sacred relic away and ignore the cowering healer priest. And indeed, the object was quickly grabbed by one of the horrid fiends. Then the whole of the army turned for the temple doors beyond and began to exit apparently not at all interested in the person who had just betrayed the shard and all his own personal convictions. <sighs> oh, you wicked monsters, go away! Sickening beasts, in the name of Sisla the Deliverer, leave this place at once! Please go! <laughs> oh, this, this isn't my destiny! Sisla, where are you? <laughs> Their mission complete, the army of Benzars slowly followed the shard out of the church and into the streets beyond, Gepinor watching in dishonor and self-pity from the pulpit above. As the last of the terrible monsters staggered from the church, Nor, Nor cautiously stepped down and crept toward an open window twenty feet away, 
peering out into the city beyond. Before him lay terrible destruction, as several dozen buildings had been damaged or destroyed. Bodies littered the streets, and mass chaos reigned within the devastated capital. The Benzar army marched unchallenged past Lord Robert's great red marble tower, carrying the shard away from the church and its people who were unable to utilize its immense power. Tears began to slide down Nor's chubby cheeks as he watched the animates disappear into the darkness with their sacred treasure. Powerless to stop them, and ashamed of his conduct within the temple. A quarter of the city of Josephine had been badly damaged by the attack. Dozens, if not hundreds, of citizens horribly massacred. And now the beloved shard of life was gone, all because he had lacked the honor and faith to tap the power within the sacred artifact. These were facts he would never admit, but they were facts all the same and the supreme healer priest continued to weep at the open window, his hopes all but gone, and his inner conscience utterly shattered. In all that is good and true, what have I done? The shard of life, gone. Dear Sisla, what have I done? Why didn't you help me, your true servant? The day had begun like most others since Redfern's departure from Mount Rebirth, warm and dry and certainly not uncomfortable. Heavy dew clung to the surrounding wetland vegetation, glistening in the morning light like diamonds in a sea of green and gray. The marshland was wild, free and alive, a near stranger to intellectual life and almost conscious of itself though nothing like Mount Rebirth experienced by Redfern several weeks ago. Snaking through the thick wetland was a simple yet immaculate dirt road, ten feet wide and appearing to be a perfectly constructed corridor through the rough vegetation. No obvious tool or implement could have done such a perfect job, even if such technological devices were culturally acceptable. The foliage carved as if someone had simply wished it to be so. Passage through the wetland just northeast of Josephine was the most dangerous part of the trip home, Redfern remembered. Its branches, vines, and roots said to be capable of capturing the unwary even while upon the magically hewn passage. Indeed, strange shadows knifed their way about the pilgrim from the trees above, their branches appearing as skeletal hands reaching out in twisted confusion. Slivers of penetrating light gave the further appearance that the place was haunted, and soon Redfern was consciously trying to stay away from the edges of the path. But the young hero was now full of living Majika, his rebirth at the Valley of Destiny complete, and he possessed all the confidence in the world that his newfound power would protect him within this dreary place. Several small creatures dashed across the water-soaked ground before Redfern, as he trekked ahead, appearing and disappearing again as if to taunt the young hero. The new wizard failed to take genuine notice, however, until he turned a corner and saw one of the fiery creatures leap across a human-sized creature lying on the path, thirty feet away and unmoving. The body appeared humanoid with dark skin rattled clothing and long black hair, and was slumped face down upon the path. The creature failed to move for several long moments, so Redfern cautiously stepped forward to better examine the body. Within moments he felt he recognized the creature, and grabbed a nearby branch to push the being onto its back, hoping his initial judgment was wrong. It's a Benzar, all right, Redfern whispered to himself quite surprised, but equally appalled by the find. It was a Benzar, all right. Vile creatures. 
they were a terrible problem for Josephine just a few years ago. But they were eradicated, along with their creator, Sandras, just before Father and I left for Chikoria about a year ago. Oh, terrible monsters, Benzars. Comprised of recently living flesh that was now mottled and bruised, the monster was dressed in filthy rags that had once served as clothing for the <coughs> for the human before his magical conversion to the animate race. The visage of the Benzar was utterly horrific. The terror and evil of the Benzar transformation process still clearly etched into its features. But what appalled Redfern the most was the inky darkness of the Benzar's eyes which had replaced the whites and revealed the creature for what it was, a cursed animate of the realm. Thoroughly repulsed by the monster, Redfern noticed a long, ghastly wound across the creature's exposed chest. This was the work of a defender's sword, the cut powerful enough to sever the heart and dispel the Majika controlling the mindless Benzar. Indeed, fresh blood oozed from the fatal wound and Redfern realized that the monster had just been destroyed. A distant shout suddenly ripped through the marshland, a human-sounding cry, more of surprise than anything else. The noise startled the wizard, and he looked around desperately for its source, his own heart beating even faster. Scanning a relatively small clearing hundreds of feet beyond, and in the direction of the voice. Tense moments passed before Redfern noticed several dark and distant shapes moving slowly through the vegetation. Not only a few days journey from, now only a few days journey from Josephine, Redfern knew he needed to find out if there were more Benzars in the army in the area, and so he cautiously hurried in the direction of the shapes, leaving the safety of the marshy path behind. Quickly moving across the spongy ground, the wizard carefully avoided the obvious pitfalls of the area, including the larger plants capable of entangling and even consuming him if he were careless. Redfern soon reached the far edge of the clearing beyond and stopped, peering past the trees and into the clearing ahead, sipping in short, rapid breaths to minimize the noise. Redfern observed more humanoid creatures slowly crossing the clearing itself nearly 100 feet in diameter and almost completely encircled by dozens of moss-covered conifers. Off to the right was a wide, shallow creek, passed over by an old and rotting wooden bridge just above the river's smooth surface. Nearly 20 feet long, the bridge appeared unoccupied, but the creatures were certainly moving toward it. Standing just within the relative safety of the clearing's edge, Redfern watched as a defender, then a, as a defender then appeared from the opposite end of the small clearing and rushed to the bridge, reaching it moments later. The tall man possessed very short black hair, almost indistinguishable from his dark skin, and his wide forehead and angry demeanor helped identify him as a denweer of the world. Strong and well-built, the Denweer bore very worn skin-hide armor, a series of thick and sturdy animal skins woven tightly together, and held in his right hand an old and nicked Sidian sword, the blade nearly four feet in length and gleaming from magically polished obsidian. As a Denweer, I prefer the wild areas of the world, far from what humans call civilization. But on the road beyond, I was attacked by a dozen Benzars and forced to fight for my life. Breathing heavily, the Denwer was in obvious trouble. Redfern spotted half a dozen Benzars pursuing the Denwer from behind, while the three in the foreground were already beginning to cross the bridge. Trapped, the Denweer valiantly readied his blade as the Benzars rushed to attack. 
Redfern had never encountered a Denwer before, their race preferring the more desolate lands of Maragall. They made for excellent defenders, the wizard knew, warriors who used their deadly combat skills only for defensive purposes. Yet this Denwer had little chance against such powerful adversaries, and Redfern knew the dark hero beyond was doomed without help. A Denwer? Here in Parappa? Strange. Denwirs, a human sister race, physically stronger, but not as disciplined, and proud, very proud. He won't want my help, but he needs me, and now, An altruistic impulse stirred within Redford, a need to help, to risk his own life for a complete stranger, to do the right thing. Acting quickly, Redford secured a nearby branch lying on the ground, closed his eyes, drew a heavy breath, and invoked the Machika embedded deep in his mind, drawing upon the living energy to change thought into genuine reality. The branch jerked, then straightened and changed color both ends flailing as if suddenly alive. A moment later, the rod transformed into a flaming doom sword, its wide silver blade magically honed and fiery to the touch. His first major spell of success, Redfern turned back in the direction of the Denwir and prepared himself for imminent combat. The Denwir proved to be an expert defender. As the larger group of monsters attacked from the rear, the hero was able to cut apart the first Benzar with one mighty slash, severing its right arm as well as its heart before causing the destroyed enemy to fall into the river below. Armed with the mind-destroying daggers, several of the remaining monsters lunged at the Denwir, each of them missing their target by well-timed parry dark hero seized the opportunity and impaled a second Benzar through the chest, destroying the mindless monster as it fell to its feet. Another Benzar lunged forward, and the Denwir spun around and tried to kick the creature backward. But the monster grabbed his foot and tripped him, causing the Denwir to fall to the floor of the bridge, his stained Sidian sword dropping into the water below. The desperate hero rolled over to protect his back as several of the hideous monsters lunged forward with their spikes of death. Utilizing all of his strength and agility, the defender rolled away at the last possible moment and dropped himself off the bridge, landing in the cool water below. Surprised by the maneuver, the Benzars turned to jump off the bridge in order to pursue the Denwer and destroy him. The water was two feet deep and crystal clear. Several large rocks embedded in the bottom of the cold creek opened a few wounds along the Denwir's left arm, but the pain was instantly forgotten within the frenzy of the moment. Spotting his fallen weapon out of the corner of his eye, the hero lunged for the trusty blade and sprang from the river, the Benzars quickly dropping down beside him. Soon the Denwir was standing alongside the creek, wounded and exhausted but again armed and ready for the vicious monsters. Swinging one of the drenched furs of his shoddy armor back around his right shoulder, the hero then headed away from the bridge, the six or seven remaining Benzars pursuing him. Out of breath and recognizing he could no longer outrun the hideous animals, the Denwir soon reached the far edge of the clearing and turned to make a last, valiant stand his back against the surrounding trees in an effort to protect himself from behind. The remaining monsters approached, encircling the brave defender and removing any chance for escape. The first Benzar lunged and the Denwir put all his strength into one massive blow, hacking the monster nearly in two and dropping it to the ground immediately. After kicking a second monster backward, the hero used his elbow to viciously smash a third Benzar in the face, breaking its nose and sending fresh blood splattering everywhere. An unseen Benzar hiding until now, 
then appeared from behind the trees that were protecting the hero, throwing a ragged arm around the Denwyr's neck and engaging him in a punishing headlock. The stranglehold was strong and painful, and the tired hero vainly struggled against the tight grip, recognizing his immediate doom if he didn't immediately escape. A sickening death cry split the air, and more blood was let. Flashes of light darted in and between the monsters, slicing and skewering the Benzar so quickly that all but one of them was slain before Redfern was even noticed. Moments later, the remains of the creatures lay at the feet of the wizard, allowing the eyes of the human and Denuir to meet for the very first time. Certainly thankful for the help, but not wanting to appear inferior, the Denwyr summoned the last of his remaining strength and flipped the remaining Benzar up and over himself, landing the monster atop his slain brethren. As if on cue, Redfern stepped forward and drove his fiery doom sword deep into the heart of the animal, destroying the pathetic monster forever. A stiff morning wind blew past the heroes chilling the Denwyr who continued to gasp for air. Though wounded by the vicious attack, the defender was nonetheless quite lucky to be alive and fixed his gaze upon the human who had just saved him. Are you all right? Redfern finally asked, still holding his magical blade at his side. I've had worse, came the Denwyr's exhausted and accented reply as he sheathed his faithful weapon and examined his new wound. You're lucky I came along. The Denwyr only nodded in recognition of Redfern, withdrawing several clean bandages from inside his worn skin-hide armor to dress the wounds on his arm. A human, but not from these parts, it seems. I do owe him my life, but what does he want in return? I am sure I can't trust him. I better be careful. Redfern scanned the area to make sure there were no more Benzars lurking about, and closed his eyes and drew another deep breath, about to utilize his Machika once more. Noticing this, the Denwyr immediately stiffened as Redfern's sword transformed into a small wooden staff, long and lean and new in appearance. The spell complete, Redfern released his breath and opened his eyes, recognizing a small loss of potential Machika within his mind, but paying little notice. The wizard then looked to the Denwyr and smiled, expecting some sort of praise and encouragement from the hero he had just saved. You, you're one of them, aren't you? gasped the Denwyr, reaching for his sword again. You mean a wizard? Yes, finally. Stepping forward to officially greet the Denwyr, the good intentions of the wizard were met with sudden hostility as the defender drew his Sidian sword again, apparently quite willing to slay the reborn hero. Take one more step and I'll kill you. Stunned by the reaction, Redfern nonetheless recognized the hatred and fear in the stranger's eyes and instinctively halted, taking the def Defender's warning seriously. That's a fine attitude to take, seeing I just saved your life. Doesn't mean I won't kill you. Redfern carefully examined the Denwyr, his mind retrieving bits of information about the species, a sister race of mankind that once saw itself as superior and nearly destroyed humanity centuries before the infamous Age of Damnation. The Denuers were ultimately defeated after the humans discovered Majika, however, and forced into disgraceful slavery for nearly a century, the time of servitude. Redfern wondered if the distant past was somehow connected to the Denuers' hatred of Majika, although, although the two races were quite friendly now, and had been since before the dawning of the Sislan Utopia twelve centuries ago.
remembering the slain monsters, Redfern bent down to better examine one. Although the monster was indeed horrid, the wizard couldn't help but feel pity for a living creature who had had its very soul magically torn away and its body transformed into such a hideous disgrace. The Benzir was the antithesis of life, a cruel mockery of the code, a physical rep representation of eternal wandering, mindless sorrow and utter hopelessness. And Redfern secretly cursed whoever or whatever was responsible for the generation of such pathetic beings. These Benzars here, Redfern said after a moment, carefully trying to downplay his role as a wizard of Mariga. Are they loose within Pirapa again? No! 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 Benzars. Living beings. Stripped of their very souls. Converted into animates. As Sisla be my witness, I will see those responsible for this destroyed one day. Loose, the Denweer sneered, surprised by the ignorance of the question. An army of them just attacked Josephine again last night. I heard there were hundreds of them this time. Stunned by the news, near panic spread through Redfern his mood passing from pride to instant heartache. Hundreds? They're gone now, back to Everwood, I suppose, the Denware responded, still eyeing Redfern suspiciously, except for a few roving bands left behind to terrorize goodly folk. But I thought all the Benzars were wiped out over a year ago, after the overthrow of Sandris. Where could these have come from? Some corrupted sorcerer like you, came the Denweir's rude reply, convincing Redfern he was indeed being condemned solely for his new profession. He doesn't know about the Benzars, it seems. Loose, where has this wizard been? Maybe he's not as mighty as he thinks. I hate them all. Although there are few wizards in the world, each of us possesses great power, for good or evil. However, it seems that more corruption than goodness is being reborn lately. A situation I intend to reverse. The wizard rose to face the defender again, a hint of both bravery and arrogance in his youthful eyes. So that's it. You're afraid of Majika, said Redfern, as if to challenge the Denwer. I'm not afraid of you. Then why are you shaking? Sure enough, the mighty Denwer was now quivering in the coolness of the marsh, facing Redfern as if he were his executioner. The wizard wondered how the dark hero could face a dozen Benzar single-handedly, and yet be so intimidated by a lone wizard especially one who was obviously trying to help. But the Denweer remained on guard and highly suspicious, so Redfern lowered his guard and stepped forward, continuing the conversation in a softer and more respectful voice. Come, I'm on my way back to Josephine. You can tell me what's been going on. He's a wizard. Your mortal enemy. Don't trust him. Remember what happened. Remember the curse. They should all be destroyed. Don't trust him. The wizard laid a gentle, comforting hand upon the warrior's broad shoulder, attempting to win the Denwer's respect and confidence. A sudden fury en enveloped the Denwer, however. Before Redfern could even react, he was viciously struck across the face and sent to the ground nearly unconscious, falling alongside the pile of slain Benzars. The Denweer bit his lip, perhaps a bit remorseful for the sudden strike, and then stepped to the fallen wizard with a combination of anger and awkward embarrassment. Be thankful. 
the den where quietly spat. You're only the second wizard ever to touch me and live. Damn wizard. He has no idea what I've gone through, what I'm going through. All because of Majika. It makes me want to kill him. Yes, his kind should all be destroyed. Sheathing his great sword once again, the defender quickly turned and sprang away back into the heart of the marsh, leaving Redfern stunned and confused amidst the destroyed monsters. Several nearby root systems began to envelop the corpses, the marsh itself seemingly coming to life in order to dispose of the waste organic matter, and warning Redfern that his time to leave had also come. Initially bewildered by the actions of the Denwyr, Redfern took only a few minutes to return to the marshy path, soon forgetting about the encounter as his mind turned to the status of Josephine ahead and the new troubles incurred by the city-state during his absence over the past year. Benzars, back in Parappa again. And what did the Denweers say? Hundreds this time? Something is very wrong back home. Very wrong. It appears my return is just in time. <laughs>